Um, good evening. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for waiting. It's not 10 minutes to 5, is it? It's 7 minutes to 5. Sorry. Um, yeah, we apologize for the delay. Um, this is the Redemption Planning Board, December 13th meeting. Um, we always open up our public hearing and begin with any comment from the public that is not on an item that is on tonight's agenda. So if anyone has a comment or something otherwise uh, not on our agenda, please come up to the podium and, uh, and let us know. And if there is no outside public comment, we'll start with our first hearing. Uh, for a site plan amendment for ServiceNet at 21 Olander Drive. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to do an introduction of a new board member. I apologize. So, uh, if you would say your name. Listen to um, I'm Terry Colhane. Welcome. Um, Thank you. Welcome. Yes. I wasn't at the last meeting, so I thought maybe oh, this is our meeting. No, this is my first meeting. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Uh, that was my fault because I didn't notice you were here because I was running well, in. Well, so, sorry about that. Do you want us to all do Yeah, let's, let's, all okay. let's go around the table and first and last name. Uh, I'm Christian Burnett. Jana White. Euripides Oliveira. Tess Peronco. Say that again. Aha! Euripides. Euripides, aren't you? Yuri. Yuri. Uh, Tess Peronco. Alan Burson. Mark Solomon. Sam Taylor. Okay. It's nice to have you here, Terry. Uh, so our first hearing is site plan amendment for ServiceNet at 21 Olander Drive. Uh, we do have one member who has recused himself, uh, Mark Sullivan, so we are uh, board of seven um, for this hearing. Is there a presentation from the applicant? Uh, I'm Bruno Calero from ServiceNet. Um, and um, last time we were here, um, there was the request to uh, formally do this for a public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, we got some support letters, we filed the application, and um, the, the same. Um, so for those who don't know, we had the vertical fins of, uh, that were supposed to be installed as an architectural design. Could you speak up a little, please? Sure. Uh, <coughs> so um, we have... Um, uh, a new building that we built up on Village Hill up in Northampton and um, as part of the architectural design there was these solar uh, fins that go on the outside of the building on the north side that uh, would help with redirecting sunlight and some heating elements into the building that was part of the original architectural design. Uh, part of it was uh, there was a delay in installing those so we um, moved into the building prior to them being installed once we were in the building, uh, we had to do things like put in uh, shades and other sustainability things. We did solar panels up on the roof to add sustainability to the, to the building. Once the solar uh, fins got started to be put in, uh, aesthetically, um, it was uh, kind of breaking up the view from inside for the employees that are in the building today. Uh, and we had to put in some solar shades anyway because the sunlight that's coming in was really right on the screens and everything else. So with that, the shades come down most of the time, cover the fin, the one fin that we had installed. We had them stop the process of installing the rest of the fins. So it's our request to have the fins removed off. And we've added other sustainability items to it, um, to the building, as I've mentioned, that were after the fact, like the solar shades and other things to help with the sustainability aspect of it. Uh, and it's kind of counterintuitive with the solar outside the solar fins outside and shades down at the same time when the sun's out uh, because we have to due to the working environment in our building. Thanks. Uh, just to kind of catch you up Terry and just remind other folks that this did come before us with a request to be an administrative meeting. <coughs> we had some discussion about both the this as a design element and an aesthetic element but also as a cooling mechanism and a, an energy reduction mechanism and so we all kind of agreed that um, that we wanted this to go through the traditional public hearing process. Uh, are there any technical questions from the board <coughs> for Bruno? Is your architect here as well? He's not but he wrote a letter of, of uh, support in the in the comment and we also got an able to write a uh, letter of support for the aesthetics side of it since he is an abutting neighbor. So. 
I thought we'd be in one. And I see too, just for just to kind of let everyone else know as well, there is a letter from Mass Development yep. saying that they don't think that this changes the appearance of the building. They don't weigh in on sustainability or energy use, but they don't think it would have a negative impact on the building's appearance if the sun shades were not installed. Yep. Um, so, what are we thinking? Yuri, what are you thinking? What I'm thinking is that, um, <coughs> Uh, I think when I, when I, I have a question with the others uh, to have a public hearing, I want to hear from the public. That's what yeah. I want. Basically, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Yeah. Because it was all the, um, open to the public, and uh, you thought it would be better if the public come and wait in. Yeah, absolutely. So, but uh, other than that. Yeah. So, yeah, there, clearly there isn't any want to hear from the public. It doesn't seem unless we'd like to take. Yeah, so we would, this is the open public hearing. So are there comments from the public on this project? So other than the one, a butter letter, and then the, the correspondence from the architect and from Mass Development, uh, it doesn't look like we have received anything, <coughs> anything else on this. So the fins were required in the beginning <coughs> for, for what reason again? They they weren't required, right? They were they were suggested as a design. They were part of the package, the design, and the purpose of them was to achieve um, certain efficiencies in the building. So the board and the zoning certainly encourage um, um, uh, buildings to be sustainable, and this is both an energy and a and a lighting um, kind of. Um, uh, addition to the exterior of the facade it also breaks up the facade a little bit from a from a design perspective on the sidewalk side so it was part of what the board approved and the purpose of those were to achieve sort of those two sort of a design characteristic as well as an energy um, saving um, purpose so um, what they're asking is to um, change the site plan essentially to uh, reflect a change in that um, facade. And the fins do, can somebody describe what the fins do again? They keep light from going in or they help reflect light into the building? They do that and then they keep, um, they, it's a heat uh, for the, when the sun um, shines on the glass, it helps to shade so that the heat from the sun doesn't come into the building. But you're saying that they are putting shades up anyway because the light is too bright for computer monitors and things Correct. like that. Correct. We, we have, with the shades get installed and the, we ended up purchasing energy efficient yeah. shades that actually help with uh, absorbing the heat and, and um, and uh, uh, the cold and stuff, keeping the cold out. So those shades on a daily basis are down when the sun is up due to the fact that the sun is beaming in mostly halfway down, which the fins are uh, three quarters up on the glass. The shades are usually about halfway down on the glass to prevent people from uh, from the sun glaring on the computer monitors. As you can imagine, uh, our we have an open floor plan so we don't have any personal offices of any individual or even management so everyone is up against the wall all the way around and the glass it's like ribbon glass that goes all the way yeah. so you can't get away from the sun beaming in or beaming into the computer monitor so we had to install shades uh to uh, help with that mm -hmm. um i, I I don't have any problem with granting this <coughs> at all. Um, uh, there are three reasons in my mind. The first is that, that it, it was never required in the first place. It was part of their design that they chose to incorporate. Had it not been in, initially incorporated, nobody on the board would have said, oh, I'm going to vote against it unless you put some funny looking fins up there. Um, it was solely their choice. It was part of the <clears throat> design of the building. 
and since it was not required by the board or by any provision of the ordinance, they didn't have to include it, and I see no reason why they cannot now change it and delete it. Uh, second, I have to <clears throat> respectfully disagree with Carolyn, our guru. Um, I, I think, first of all, <clears throat> what Carolyn expresses is essentially a design opinion about what looks good. And uh, I don't even agree with that opinion. I think the building looks great right now, the way it is. And in any event, I don't think we're in the business of imposing our opinions about design and style on applicants. Um, so I think it would be wrong to require those fins because someone thinks they might look better. I don't know. I think it would look worse. <coughs> and the third thing is that as far as the energy efficiency, um, if we read the letter from their architect, he goes into some detail as to the efficiency of the building as it is now and with the addition of the solar panels, which was not part of their original design, it now is on the building, and the, the type of glass that they've used, and the solar shades that Bruno just referred to, uh, apparently the building is working very efficiently now. And to me it doesn't make sense to force them at some considerable expense to put these fins on when it's already a very efficient building. So I feel that we ought to <coughs> approve their deleting that from their original plan. Any other comments? Uh, it, you can say no. No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't mean to force you. I no. just want to make sure you're... No, um, fully. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this, this was, you know, a tricky one. I agree with you. Alan on the the I don't you know the design aspect of it I think is you know if all things being equal if I were designing the building I would have them but but I'm more concerned with you know the the energy use issue and I think that that you're right the architect references this but there's no there is no data I mean this should just be a math problem but we have yet to see you know what kind of energy is being used in this brand new building you know, the other piece of it is we did permit brand new construction versus, you know, using an existing vacant downtown building with this much square footage. You know, there's, there were other options. So I think we're right to be kind of concerned about the energy efficiency of the buildings. It, it's, you know, it's a shame that there isn't just some more hard data in here about how the building has been performing. I, you know, I respect the architect, but, you know, the statement that it's performing quite efficiently doesn't really, it doesn't really mean anything, well, you know? I agree with you, Tess, in terms of the data, but there's no information as to how these fins would add to the efficiency either. Right. Maybe they would. Right. Why how? No, you're right, and that's why it's a challenging you know, thing. At all. I mean, it's you know, in the absence of that, <coughs> it is hard to make you know a sort of evidence-based decision. This is right. you know, this has to happen. Um, you know, by and large, usually we like for people to build the project that we permitted in the plan, but um, you know, I could see. A scenario where, yeah, but I think this is different. That. This is different than like, you know, if if at the end of the project they said, oh, I'm going to decide to use oil instead of, <laughs> instead, instead of you know, then you're like, you're like, oh, well, that's, but I, I actually don't think that in this in the spirit of efficiency, I, I feel like they're they're continuing that spirit forward. Right. It's not. Right. They're changing their plans, and plans change. Right. But as long as the spirit moves forward, I think we should all embrace it all. They just to clarify too, I mean, yeah. they also, they did obviously, as noted, they made changes in the um, yeah. building to <coughs> increase their, or reduce their, um, you know, their consumption and putting um, renewable energy source on the roof and all of that. I do want to clarify though, the Plan Village does have design standards, so it is in the Planning Board jurisdiction to look at design, not everywhere in the city, but certainly um, at the State Hospital. Well, the other point to be made, though, is that Mass Development approves it. 
from, I mean, they're from the, the design enforcers, design. presumably, of the design standards that they promulgated. And they say they're okay with deleting these. Well, I don't think it's their design, right? I mean, they didn't promulgate design standards. They have a separate yeah. review process for design. So they have to yeah. prove that everything that the planning board all right. has to make sure. But that they would defer to us at the yeah. local level. Um, well, do you have other strong opinions on this side of the well, I, mean, I like the way the things look, but again, like Sam said, I, in the spirit, they're, I can see in this additional picture that they have a lot of shades down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like if they're already going to use shades and they have the fins, then, you know, removing the fins, they're still going to use the shades and the fins really wouldn't do anything additional anyway, so. I'm a little bit surprised why this wasn't thought of to begin with. If it was built for service then and the plan was to have an open office and there are windows all over the place and computer screens, it seems like this might have come up a lot earlier in the process. Yeah. Um, and if the space were ever to be used in a different way or laid out, then this might, um, and people were pushed up against the walls, then the shades might not need to be down. I mean, you can imagine a different use of the space that, that would make the fins a more essential element if the shades were no longer needed. Um, but given the current use, it seems. That's such an interesting point because, uh, you know, I guess we look at these plans. We're we're looking at the the envelope or the wrapper of the building, not you know the behavior of the people inside of it. So you know because that's going to change. That's going to change a lot over time. And so it's, I think that's why we care so much about these aspects of it because this you yeah, know, you've just constructed a giant building. It's going to be here for generations. And so you know we want to make sure that that that. Right. Doesn't change. I just like to add that ServiceNet, as a uh, nonprofit organization that decided to, to call Northampton its headquarters for many, many years, and we own a lot of other buildings in Northampton. We've added solar to almost all the buildings that we have here in Northampton. We add sustainability to them, and we called it home, and we went really above and beyond the sustainability requirements uh, that uh, if we would have came for a building permit. And I think that from the design standpoint, uh, I, I understand what you're, you're stating. We plan on being there. We called it our headquarters. We've been around for a really long time, and uh, we serve the community. And I think that from that aspect and uh, the solar glare and everything else that we added in, if it's something we could always put it back on, if it ended up being uh, something that we wanted to do, it's definitely something when we talked to the architect, it was an added cost that we added in because we care about the sustainability. It's just not a practical element of the building at this point with the shades down and other things that are happening. Do we feel like we need more discussion, more technical information? Do we feel like we are ready to take a vote? Oh, yeah, so, uh, well, we'll start by closing the public hearing. Yeah, move to close the public hearing. Just a second. Just a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah, I'll move that we approve their application to remove the architectural element. Is there a second? Sam? All those in favor of allowing the site plan amendment to include the deletion of the solar fins at 21 and Olander Drive. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Our 720 hearing is a site plan amendment uh, for 209 Earl Street um, by VCA Incorporated. Is there a presentation from the applicant? Yes.
test that yours? previous permit for their building and what we're um, here for is um, an amendment to the previous permit and so in the original permit um, there was a oh a 12,000 square foot building approved um, and and then an additional 12,000 square foot addition um, so we're here today because we're, we'd like to expand the addition from 12,000 square feet to um, 14,560, I believe, um, and adding a second driveway with uh, truck access to the new addition and a 20 space parking lot. Um, along with that, um, due to the grading on the site, um, we have added an extended um, sidewalk. Um, uh, because the new one will need to be removed, it's it's in the way of grading, um, and uh, and then along with uh, the stormwater management for the new parking lot, we have a rain garden that's going to discharge into the city sewer, storm sewer. Uh, that's that's the bulk of it. Um, this the site you know originally had um, stockpiled material off in the uh, um, southwest corner um, that will be removed to make way for the addition um, and then the, the new site um, where the parking lot is 20 space parking lot will have stormwater management with the rain garden as I said a moment ago um, along with that we also have a, a planting plan that goes with it um, with you know the minimal amount of trees being added. There's already a fair number of trees that are there that will remain with a couple that need to be removed for grading uh, purposes. That's about it. That's it. <laughs> uh, technical questions from the board? Uh, Karen, any comments from DPW or, or emergency services about um no there are no concerns um about that um, additional driveway dpw did send comments this afternoon about um, um just making sure that the the driveway is um there's a apron um that doesn't exceed 15 percent um slope on the plans um and um just issues about really about um, locating easements on the property, the sewer easements on the property, um, and um, just some details about um, the 
plans itself about the trenching and um, and tree protection. Um, but other than that, there are no issues about that. Could this, and I'm 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 for this, but could this in any way prevent? There's 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 room for a, another development in that area. Is that correct? To the north. To yeah. The north to the side. northeast. So the other driveway that was created for um, that was built um, for the original building is a shared driveway mm -hmm. for the property to the north. So that's a developable parcel that um, will be accessed using that existing driveway. So there's already a shared driveway for those um, two parcels. So this additional driveway won't prevent any future growth on that end? Of right. Okay. Right. There was also a note about the the roof system being structured to carry PV. Is that yes, something it is. you could speak to? Okay. It, and is that is there something on the plans that indicates that or if it's um, No, that, that would be in the architectural plans. Okay. Um, and that was um, addressed in an email to Carolyn. Uh, right, so for a clarification, they were on the architectural plans, uh, oh the floor plans I should say. Uh -huh. But um, that is not what's in the site plan submittal, but they, um, the applicant followed up with uh, a text document indicating that their intention is to put um, install PV on the roof. They installed it on the first portion, phase one of the building, yeah. um, and their intention is to follow up. So you can also make that as a condition that as part of the building permit, they need to show that they're actually, that they're at least building it structurally to support um, PV. So that's sort of, becoming a standard condition for these site plans that at the building permit level they need to show their plans that um, and that makes sense to you you can know more of that oh yeah no that, that, that's planned in here <laughs> The same ones that we're doing. That's right. There's, 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 I think you addressed it a little bit through the plans that I have here. So the finished drawing for the sidewalk? No, they do not. And the, the only ones are up there, are right. they? Yeah. So I can't. So let me see if I can zoom in a little for you. They they were submitted for the record at the office, but you don't have a printed copy of that. Right. So one of the things that will be submitted will be a full construction set. But so this is the new sidewalk here coming down. Mm -hmm. The old sidewalk terminated right here. Yeah. Uh, went up and into this graded area. So that needed to be uh, originally, it, it really doesn't get used at all. So originally we weren't going to do the sidewalk at all, but the zoning requires a connection to the sidewalk mm -hmm. and it needs to be ADA. Um, so we we put this in and, and that's an ADA compliant sidewalk. And then it, there's a sidewalk also up above from the parking lot to a portion of the building? Yeah, the, the standard handicap parking's over here. At the, at the entrance to the building, which is right here. Uh -huh. and, that, and that remains. Okay, but on the parking lot, there's on another the parking lot, lot that comes from the new No, this is an employee. This is not a handicap accessible parking lot. But, but there is a sidewalk. There is a sidewalk, yes. There's a sidewalk right along the edge here. And it kind and of ends over. And then, and then folks who can come across and go through the door here or here. Um, Carolyn, in the, in the past, I think it was, um, I think it was River Valley Market, we, and we talked about this before, uh, constructing a sidewalk to nowhere um, along the length of the <coughs> property. It's already there. On the left side? Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. Can you? I think it goes all the way down to the intersection. Oh, okay. It's just not on this drawing. Is it, do you have an existing condition plan? Yeah. Gary, I'm just looking for that. Yes. So that was as part of the reconstruction yeah. oh, okay. of Earl Street gotcha. um, in this project. That's it. I saw. So this is the sidewalk yep. that's there now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and current, currently it only really gets used by skateboarders. <laughs> skateboarders are people do. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other questions or comments?
comments from the board. Let's open it up for the public. <coughs> uh, and I'm sure we may have to ask you a couple of questions. Um, sure. But we'll open it up for the public. If anyone has a comment, come on up to the podium. Please tell us your name and your address. So Jonathan Yorga, uh, 188 Earl Street. So I'm the closest to Butter. Um, and when Earl Street was redesigned, um, they tried to deal with the water coming off that hill. And um, we still, to this day, have water that comes across the sidewalk and the road. Um, I have to be on the road at 5 a.m. and it's clear ice on that hill. So my concern is they're going to have the same problem with the parking lot. And is that rain garden going to actually address that issue or are we making it worse? When the street was redone, a berm was removed from in my driveway. They kept water out of my driveway, but then the road was raised. So they weren't able to put a burn back in. So any additional water that ends up in the street ends up in my yard. And my neighbor um, can't be here. Uh, she's a single parent as well, has the same issue with the water coming down. And then the next residence would be the apartment complex. But again, that's the same issue. We have directional drains in the road and everything. I mean, all the engineering intentions were there, but it's not working there you can if you go walk down the sidewalk now um you can see where they put all the rocks to collect the water and the water has made its own path to the, to the side of it and the dpw has been pretty good at taking care of it but i have to get up at 4 a.m and be on the road by 5 and sometimes it's not taken care of um also when cars are traveling up that hill they're accelerating and I did have to respond to a rollover where a vehicle lost traction, regained traction, and went up that embankment and rolled down. And it was a group of Smith School students one morning. Um, so that's, that's, that's my concern. Um, Thank you. Other than that, they're great neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> no complaints there. Can just you, just concerned about the Can you tell me, are you, are you referring to um, are you referring to right here? Yes. Yeah. So Tony has been out there, and he he's currently dug out the ditch because it did have that blowout in the in the upper bank. Right. Um, but part of what's proposed here is to reconstruct the swale, also to accommodate um, the new the new system. Um, so this is this is where it is. The ditch is going to be dug deeper down in here. Um, and reconstructed a uh, new new outfall here so it won't be coming down the bank what happened was as you said it blew out the bank right ahead of the, the stone and filled in the scale and so that's that's no longer uh, overflowing going over the sidewalk so that that will also be addressed it's in cold for any water to flow now. <laughs> well no it's still flowing but um one of the conditions in our O&M is to maintain that ditch. Okay. Okay. Um, as far as the stormwater management, stormwater management, all the stormwater here is being collected before it can go onto the street. It's actually being reduced. So. Uh, right. That was my hope is that you know, we we'll address yeah. that, but you know, a bunch of squiggly lines on a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to talk about it. Sure. And then I guess my only other concern is is uh, when the when the plow company you use pushes the snow onto the city road, they stop before they get to the curb, and then when the city plow comes down, they're now further away from the curb. So when they get to my house, there's like this much more snow between the road and the the street. So that's that's the only other concern I have. I understand they're not supposed to be putting snow on the road. <laughs> that's, that's not how it's hard to push it uphill. I get it. It's like come downhill, but yeah. you know, if, if we didn't have the granite curves that could cut it off the road or something across the way. The, um, the the good thing, just to kind of reiterate what Terry said, and this happens in a lot of our applications, that the stormwater management systems, the the maintenance agreements for those systems are often you know part of this process, and you know, the, I mean, both the applicant and the butters want those systems to be maintained, and so. Um, you know, there's there's an incentive for them to make sure that that, that functions as it is designed, even though it's squiggly lines now. You know, they're um, I would say right. keep I an also, eye on I it. I also dealt with mass development that did the road, and then there was an issue, and nobody wanted to do anything about it. 
you you said you didn't want to do anything on a lot of business and that development project. So what is our, do we have, I mean, is there a stormwater? Uh, There's a stormwater permit that's been issued. Okay. So as um, Terry noted that um, there, as part of the management plan, um, that will then have to be go on record and they'll have to do annual maintenance in accordance with that plan. So that's not only what's submitted to you as the planning board, but there's a separate permit um, under the stormwater ordinance. And that's enforced by the building department? <coughs> that's enforced by the um, DPW. Okay, so if someone, yeah identifies a problem, then a complaint could be sent to DPW saying, I don't think this is functioning as it's right. supposed to. Well, they're gonna have to submit an as-built. So okay. the design has been submitted and reviewed and approved, um, as um, Terry noted, will include, um, you know, reconstruction essentially of that section of the swale, and then they'll be captured, water will be intercepted from the hill mm -hmm. in that new system that's at the base of that parking lot so um, the calculations that were submitted and what was modeled show that you know there's not an increase in that um, runoff coming off the hill mm -hmm. but also there'll be a correction to that swale okay. yeah now, actually the runoff coming off from the upper hill is being reduced because a portion of that was originally intended to go to the tension basin mm -hmm. up um, towards a towards the stables there, um, the tension basin five, and so a, a good portion of the hill is now not going to be coming down there, um, so it's further reduced that way. Okay. Comments, questions from the board? So just to be clear, hypothetically, come next fall when it's very rainy and the sheet flows over the swale and onto the road and starts freezing in the morning. The uh, butter's recourse is to call the DPW and say there's an issue. Well, <coughs> just because there's extra water coming up the hill doesn't mean there's a problem with the system. It could be torrential down mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. But, um, yes, I mean, hypothetically, if there's a, an issue of runoff in the road, yeah, anywhere in the city, you know, contact DPW, DPW can determine if, you know, is there something backed up in the city system that needs to be addressed? So I, I would say that for anybody. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Discussion among the board? Other questions that folks have? How are folks feeling? And this is the kind of thing we're trying to promote, so yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. George? So, yeah, I think it's a wonderful project. I think we're, you know, I think it's been a great business. The expansion is really nice for good jobs in the city. Um, I, I do have a question just because of all of our, uh, our our concern nowadays around extra rainwater, um, mitigating carbon impact and all. Our, our new parking lot is um, surface, you know, it's a hard surface. Do we have any look at all or any kind of oh, alternatives for part, new parking lots like this to be made out of other materials that's somewhat permeable to water or it's all not in this situation? It's really site specific based mm -hmm. on the soils. Um, so, um, but there's no, I, so the zoning requires um, um, an analysis of green infrastructure um, as part of the stormwater calculation. So if it's possible, then yes, there's a requirement that the applicants look at um, a system that's not just a detention and discharge system. Mm -hmm. But it's not always um, feasible based it, on soil conditions. It's complicated to do forest pavement. Unless you're doing an entire area, um, the, the having mixed surfaces <coughs> is a maintenance problem. Um, additionally, in a situation like this where you have a steep grade going up a drive, you don't you want to be able to sand it. Um, that's a, that's the thing. So that's why we go to the rain garden. If we could infiltrate in the rain garden, we would infiltrate there. But the the soils are not suitable. Any concerns, questions? To 
did you have something else you wanted no. to say that you, <laughs> that you regretted us closing public on? Yeah. Um, um, so there weren't very many comments, you know, in terms of conditions. Just one just, on the CV. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I did and have other, a, a uh, couple of others, um, just that the, um, the tree protection um, for all the trees labeled to remain in place be installed in accordance with um, city standards and inspection done prior to construction that could fall under you know prior to building permit that should be done mm -hmm. um, and then um, DPW just requested to see construction plans 15 days prior to issuance that would include the um, details um, for um, um, modifications to um, some of the site elements um, that were detailed in their um, memo. So they're just technical um, clarifications on the plan. Do you have a motion? Uh, I move to approve the site plan amendment for second driveway and foot <coughs> expansion by VCA 8209 Earl Street with Hampton Map ID 38A 103 with the conditions uh, that the applicant shall submit revised plans incorporating all relevant, I'm sorry, um, the building permit plan shall show how the roof system is structured to carry PD panel loads and electrical, electrical requirements, uh, tree inspection, uh, tree protection uh, plans and uh, shall be submitted and inspected prior to the issuance of a building permit and construction documents shall be submitted to the DBW 15 days prior to the issuance of the building permit to review technical details. Is there a second? Chat? All those in favor? Those opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marcel's got a motion. Nah, how can anybody else make motions like that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you. Our is a request for a continuation of the application 236 South Street. Um, this hearing has been continued a number of times and the applicant has requested a continuance to the January 24th meeting. Uh, there are some other items for the recommendation is that we continue to January 24th at 7 30 p.m. Is there a motion to make? So I got the 29th and there was another one. I didn't there was the other one. Yeah, the, uh, November 8th. 8th and 29th. I wasn't over 29th, so you can just vote to accept it. Okay. So, Alan, we have the motion here. All those in favor of the minutes from the 8th of November, 29th of November? Aye.
I believe meets all of the criteria of your newly adopted solar ordinance. Um, to speak first would be Steve Ondition, who is the project manager for Con Ed Development, to tell you just a little about the project. And then Meg Gagnon has the presentation uh, of the engineering and the specifics for the project. So with that, I turn it over to Steve. consideration. My name is Steve Ondition with uh, Con Edison Development. I'm very happy to be here and we're excited to present uh, a community solar project um, for the benefit of, uh, of all. And this is a 5.6 megawatt facility which is uh, I have to say that it can power roughly 500 to 600 homes. A uh, facility of this size is able to reduce carbon emissions over its lifetime, which is about 20 years, on the order of about 8 million pounds of CO2. Um, as Ed mentioned, the facility itself will occupy roughly 23 acres of land. Kind of development will be donating 20 acres adjacent to the city of Northampton uh, for permanent preservation or for use as the city sees fit. Uh, Con Ed builds, owns, and operates uh, all of its solar projects, including this one. Uh, and uh, we want to mention also that there will be a, a natural buffer of, uh, of trees surrounding the facility, which uh, uh, we'll hear more about later in the presentation. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Mike Gagnon. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Gagnon, senior civil engineer. Uh, with Malone and McBroom, uh, part of the Con Edison team. And first and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank you um, for this opportunity. And what I would like to do is just kind of go over some of the technical uh, details of the project, um, kind of talk about some of the coordination um, that we've done with uh, city staff. But what I'd like to start off with is um, on this particular site, uh, there has been a number of due, dil due diligence uh, investigations um, that have been undertaken over the past couple of months. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the wetlands uh, were flagged uh, by our soil scientist staff um, in October of 2017 and as of recently, uh, June of 2018. Um, to do some follow-up uh, delineation and also to coordinate uh, with the neighboring property to the west. Uh, we've conducted, um, as you'll see in a moment, on the plans, um, the uh, field survey and base plans um, were prepared by Sherman and Frederick, uh, our uh, sub-consultant that's working with us uh, to survey the site um, and ultimately uh, we'll be putting together uh, the Alta and the boundary um, requirements um, for Con Edison. 
Uh, we also conducted a, a rather in-depth uh, phase one site assessment um, of the parcel. Um, a report uh, can be made available if necessary. Um, and then lastly, um, in support of the photovoltaic um, assemblies, uh, we undertook a geotechnical uh, investigation as well. Um, I believe there's some experts of that report that are included in the application. Uh, I, I believe the uh, boring logs um, and such. And also part of that geotechnical investigation was uh, really to determine where groundwater was. Um, <clears throat> just recognizing the previous activities uh, that have been undertaken on that site, um, we were concerned um, about where groundwater was. This is a aerial photograph um, with the proposed project uh, superimposed. I uh, just kind of want to point out uh, where the heart of the facility is going to be, uh, particularly in the wet. Uh, by the way, north um, is to the right of the page, uh, this orientation. Um, the area where the stormwater management basin is, this is where the heart of the previous mining activity took place uh, for uh, aggregate, um, sand, etc. And all of that area um, will be improved this is part of the facility I'll get into the details of that but I think this drawing actually shows a good representation of, of what the site is going to look like um, as superimposed over um, existing conditions the green shaded area um, actually represents the land um, that will be donated by Con Edison as part of this project the 20 or so acres um, and this also shows the vast amount of wetland resource area uh, that exists on this site at the top of the page. And then uh, Parsons Brook meanders down uh, pretty much right through the, the middle of that green area on the right hand side. This is our index plan and I think this just gives you a good overview um, of what the overall site looks like in the surrounding streets. Um, site is pretty much bound, bounded by uh, Burt's Pit Road slash Ryan Road uh, that runs along the northerly part of the project site. Uh, to the south um, the is pretty much residential area with Lady Slipper Lane uh, being the closest street uh, in proximity to the project. Con Edison will be acquiring a uh, access and interconnection easement um, that's going to be running out to Ryan Road. Um, that will be uh, coordinated with the adjacent property owner. There is an existing access road um, from Ryan Road that, that uh, goes to the property and that, and that will be utilized uh, as part of this project. Just to go over some of the noteworthy aspects of, in terms of the existing conditions of the site. Um, as I mentioned, project location, Burt's Pit Road, the site is essentially comprised of two parcels, uh, parcel 79 and 80, um, as depicted on the assessor's map, such that the total area, uh, site area of the project, not the, not the solar array, but, but the two parcels in whole are going to be about 49.6 acres. Um, the site is mostly within the water supply overlay district. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, pretty significant gravel processing uh, operation um, on the site associated with the uh, Bill Willard uh, company uh, for a number of years. Consequently, uh, particularly in, in our particular project area, uh, there's quite a few aggregate stockpiles that were left behind. Um, and there's actually one large uh, concrete debris pile um, that, that, that is really visible on the site. And I guess what I would like to mention too is that all of that material is going to be reused um, as part of this project. So that will actually effectively have a balanced site. Um, there's about roughly 81,000 cubic yards of earth moving um, that's, that has to occur. But all of that material is going to stay on site. And also, there's not going to be any uh, import of any borrow um, that's going to be required either. Uh, 
existing cover characteristics, um, as I had mentioned early on, it is a degraded site. Uh, there's a lot of bare soil uh, throughout the, the, the heart of the project area with a lot of exposed gravel. Um, you know, some ongoing issues with, uh, with erosion um, associated with the runoff from the site. Um, and again, with, with the mining and the, and the, the uh, aggregate stop pause, the topography is very uneven out there, uh, moderate to steep slopes, uh, particularly along the, the southerly end of the project. And then just the last I'd like to mention is, uh, as everybody knows, the site was recently cleared um, by the existing property owner that consisted of about 14 acres um, of tree removal. So what I'd like to do is just kind of step through the, the individual plan sheets. These are the, uh, this is actually up at the northerly end of the site. Um, this really depicts uh, the 200 foot riverfront area um, that runs along the, the top of the page there that is associated with uh, Pearson, Parsons Brook. This is the mat sheet, which is the lower um, or the southerly area of the project. This is in, in uh, the area of Lady Slipper Lane. Uh, just a note here that there is a pretty significant isolated wetland um, that will be protected. Um, that's that's up at the uh, southeast corner of the site, as shown there. This is the neighboring sheet to the, to the left. This is as we're starting to go out towards the westerly end of the site. And what this shows um, is the existing gravel access road um, that runs along that vast uh, wetland area um, to the north. And just to make mention here that um, that road will be utilized uh, as part of the project. And then lastly, um, this is out at Ryan Road. Uh, this is the existing roadway uh, where the uh, interconnection pole line will be run and ultimately uh, tie into the existing three-phase power on the road. Now to get into some of the proposed project uh, details, um, this is a ground-mounted PV solar array um, which will be mounted on a, a system of the actual panels themselves uh, will be mounted on racking assemblies, uh, which are supported by galvanized steel posts. Um, pretty conventional. Um, uh, these type of systems are, are widely used. A, a lot of are already uh, in existence in the area. Uh, the actual facility in itself will be about 23 acres. Uh, that's within the fenced compound area. Um, as I had mentioned, the interconnection um, is going to be all the way out at Ryan Road. And that will be, uh, the power uh, will be brought out to Ryan Road um, on overhead uh, utility poles, um, very similar to uh, what you would see uh, in a residential area. Um, so consequently, in order to do that, Con Edison um, needs to get an easement um, from the adjacent um, who is going to be the future uh, property owner to, to the west of us for the site. The site will, as I had mentioned earlier, the site will be graded out to reduce all of those steep slopes uh, that are out there now. Um, I'll show you some of that detail in a moment um, on the grading plans. And um, as I had mentioned, all of that material will be used um, on the site such that we have a, a balanced site. The facility itself, uh, will be enclosed uh, with a seven-foot high chain link fence. Um, I understand that that's actually required um, by the electric code. Uh, there will be uh, security cameras um, within the project area to monitor um, the facility uh, as well, and there will be a gated access uh, into the compound area. Stormwater management for the project, we've provided a uh, stormwater management basin to attenuate the uh, peak flow um, from the runoff from the site. And as with these projects, the principle that we used, it's called disconnected impervious runoff. And recognizing that we have a series, a whole series, there's about 16,000 uh, glass panels or so uh, that are the, uh, the solar panels. They are impervious. However, what the disconnected uh, impervious principle is, is that 
the water that gets on those panels is allowed to make contact with the ground directly beneath and will actually run across um, the grass surface uh, that will be uh, restored uh, on, on the site. Country drainage practices will be utilized and what that means is it's conventional uh, grass swales. Uh, there's no stormwater uh, infrastructure, um, series of pipes or catch basins or the like um, that are going to be proposed as part of this project. It's all going to be a uh, natural runoff uh, across the grass areas and is directed uh, into the stormwater management basin. The overall flows from the site have been uh, reduced for the two to 100 year events. Um, what we did is we actually matched the one year storm event. Um, that's critical uh, for this project, recognizing the amount of uh, wetland resource area um, because we don't want to over detain, which could be uh, detrimental uh, to those wetland resources. So just to get into the, the details, uh, this is the northerly end uh, of the solar facility uh, that shows the layout of the panels, um, as I had mentioned. Um, it also shows the, uh, the grading uh, that's going to take place as part of the project, um, as well as the layout of the fence. Um, you know, this is the southerly half of the project. This gets into a little bit more detail. Um, that shows the actual electric uh, interconnection coming into the site. Uh, there is going to be a small hammerhead that's going to be constructed on the westerly portion of the compound for maintenance access uh, to the facility. And the stormwater management basin is located just above that, um, as you can see. And the reason for the odd-looking configuration of the stormwater basin is that we needed to we're right up against uh, bordering land subject to flooding or the hundred year flood zone so we had to very carefully uh, grade the the outer edge of the basin such that um, we weren't impacting uh, that resource area this slide again just shows um, what's going to happen in terms of the electrical interconnection it actually shows the pole line um, going out towards uh, the west and ultimately uh, will terminate out at Ryan Road um, as shown here. As part of construction, um, obviously we have to implement uh, erosion and sediment controls um, during the project to ensure that uh, there's no migration of uh, uh, sediment associated in, in the runoff. Um, first and foremost, there will be a construction at entrance pad um, that will be constructed um, into the facility. Uh, ENS controls essentially will consist of silt fence. Um, we also have silt fence uh, that are backed with stake uh, straw bales, um, particularly in areas where we're adjacent to the wetland resource areas. And then lastly, um, there is a few areas where we're showing compost filter tubes um, in the large swale that runs down through the, the middle of the site to help uh, keep the keep the runoff um, in check. Temporary uh, controls will be installed as required, um, and the site will be continuously monitored um, in accordance with the EPA NOI construction general permit. Again, because we're, we're greater than one acre of disturbance. Uh, we have to file with EPA uh, with, a, with a comprehensive uh, stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, that, by the way, along with our stormwater management uh, report, uh, was reviewed um, by Doug, Doug McDonald, and I believe he has submitted his comments um, as well. And then lastly, um, the site will be stabilized uh, with the placement of topsoil and seed. Uh, the seed mix that's used for these type of projects is a conservation mix, uh, which is a, a little bit of clover and grasses. And the idea is that um, these facilities, they don't like to mow them once a week like your lawn. Uh, it's more of the cut is uh, about six to eight inches high um, so that uh, you know they're only mowing these facilities twice or three times a year, depending on how much rain we get, obviously. 
So the next two sheets just depict um, the sediment and erosion controls um, that will be employed as part of the project. Uh, what we're showing here is a suggested uh, temporary stockpile area um, that's going to be located up in the northwest, northwest corner of the site. Um, we've also highlighted here um, the, the little shaded polygons um, that are at the lower end of the page there represent the existing uh, aggregate stockpiles that will be uh, removed and essentially reused on, on the project. This is the lower half of the page. Again, shows a little bit more detail. And I just want to point out that that large polygon uh, that's in the upper left-hand corner of the sheet, that represents the large uh, concrete um, debris stockpile that's currently out there on the site. Um, all of that material uh, is going to be processed uh, roughly to six inch minus aggregate um, and all of that material will be used as base um, either uh, in the gravel roads uh, that will be used on the project or underneath the, uh, the utility, the various utility pads. Um, these are just some of our standard construction details. I, I won't uh, go into a lot of explanation here, but this is our uh, sedimentation erosion control details. All of our general notes, we uh, indicate some of the stabilization practices uh, that are required as part of the project. And okay, I guess. So ultimately, um, hopefully this is what the facility is going to look like um, at the end. This is actually an artist's uh, rendering um, of the project looking from the west. Um, so with that, uh, just a couple of other details um, that, that I'd like to discuss before, uh, before I close here. Uh, we've been working um, with the planning department and one of the things um, that we recognize is obviously as a result of the recent clearing activities, there were a number of significant trees uh, that were removed. So Con Edison um, recognizes that they're obligated, that there has to be a replacement um, conducted uh, for that. Uh, so we are or will be working um, um, with planning staff um, in order to come up with a, a, a doable plan, um, so to speak. Um, in addition, or related to that too, we've uh, been in contact with a few of the abutters on Lady Slipper Lane, and it is our commitment that we will work with them uh, through the course of the project and provide any um, mitigation or screening plantings um, as necessary. Um, we've also been working uh, with the Conservation Commission as well. Um, there is a small area um, of impact associated with a stormwater management basin um, that, uh, that's in the upland area, the upper fringe of the one foot buffer. It's about a, just under a 6,000 square foot area. Um, so we are working with uh, Sarah LaValle um, to work out those details. And with that, and I guess the last point I'd like to make is uh, um, relative to stormwater. Um, we just received our approval from Doug McDonald on the stormwater permit. However, uh, he has a number of conditions um, that need to be considered that we need to fulfill um, during, during the course of the project. So with that, uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, question on the Doug McDonald's comments or TBWs. Were there any issues uh, raised that are red flag issues uh, with the applicant that are just technical details that you have to work out? I think mostly check. technical in nature um, that we have to work out. Doug had a question about where some of the runoff at the southwesterly, um, <coughs> excuse me, portion of the property, how that was getting conveyed to the basin. And as of last night, <laughs> we actually worked out those details and, you know, he seemed <coughs> satisfied. Um, one of the other concerns that he did have, and, and we certainly recognize it too, um, is the high groundwater condition of the site. 
So what we are, um, what we will be doing is we'll have to undertake uh, some additional test pits um, to see where the groundwater uh, is uh, in the area of the basin. Um, one of the things I did point out is this year we've gotten an awful lot of rain, um, so groundwater conditions are going to be um, much higher than usual. So. Or this might be the new one. Right. Or it could be the new one. <laughs> Correct. It seems like the line of utility poles taking the power out to the street will be within the view of the houses along Lady Slipper Lane. Are there any lights on those poles? No lights. And will they be readily visible to those people or are things arranged such that so the utility pole the string as it as it heads out to the west um the exist there there's not going to be any clearing of trees um in that area and that area is somewhat depressed also mm -hmm. from lady slipper lane um maybe this time of year they they might see the tops of the poles but um you know they're they're what about 40 40 feet 35. high 35 40 feet high yeah. something like that and no sight lighting at all no sight lighting at all okay. no. okay. question on lady slipper lane you talked about uh, screening plantings uh between the site and and the abutters some of the comments from staff talked about a fence as has has any details been landed on or is it just a general discussion with the uh abutters or would you have an issue if a, if a fence is requested or uh, is it per, are planting preferred by the abutters and if so who does the maintenance and all that sort of stuff no great question so starting off i, I don't think you know on um, the type of fencing um, that, that is used to enclose the project is is chain link right uh, recognizing um it's not the prettiest thing to look at but it is required by code so what we like to offer on these projects is um, evergreen screening plantings um, that will help mitigate the views and, and provide that that's what we would suggest um, initially and is, are those on the details of the <coughs> not, not? not at this time those details are have to be worked out so tip, typically in the past what how what's the height of those evergreens that you would plant they can get you know eight to ten plus high depending on the species um, no, that's what they can so get but you don't plant them as the, 10 feet top do you um they could they can be six or eight feet high when they're planted okay. what species um i'm not a landscape ar architect but um typical um native evergreen species uh, it, we would utilize all native plantings so, so Carolyn, just, with, with it, if, if it was a six to eight foot vinyl fence or a six to eight foot evergreen plant, would be, would be so I, initially, yeah, I mean, I think um, sort of since I sent my staff report to you all recommending <coughs> the fence, initially when I looked at it, it was hard to tell where the slope dropped down. So clearly, if the slope drops down and you plant trees at the bottom of the slope, it's not going to do anything to screen the um, running parcels. But I did go to the site and I and, um, actually noted that the, there is a top of slope where trees could be planted. And I think it's probably more appropriate to have a um, tree planting, particularly given all the trees that were taken down, um, that um, that would create, um, you know, the trees could grow taller too and fuller right. and um, than any, you know, than a six foot fence. So my um i guess i would modify what i had recommended originally that, that was based on concern about the topography um so i think that um given that it's not clear how many trees that would take or what location um you know you could look for revised plans or you could have the uh, you know just dictate that along the Effective properties, and you'll probably hear from the abutters um, to know exactly which properties those are and where those could be planted. That would also help um, with the replacement requirement. Right. So I mean, part of that requirement would be that right. 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 Part of the, so the tree calculations that the <coughs> one of the recommendations of prior sign off for tree calcs should be approved by staff. In addition, can we say that at the top of the slope? 
at Lady Slipper Lane, they should be evergreen trees to be worked out and approved by the applicant and staff or something like that. Yeah, you could um, have it um, specify that, that it's, a, it's um, to be planted close enough to create um, an, a screen, a full screen. Right. Upon so you said, you know, yeah. I just didn't want you to plant an 18 inch twig, you know, 10 feet on center and walk away. Right. So. Yeah. I, I just want to make one point. If, if you look at the plans, you'll notice, and the ordinance requires, the 50-foot buffer right. is already left as natural, mm -hmm. and it sits in a bowl, and these are seven feet high, so a little taller than this. Right. Um, so, you know, the visibility, but to thicken that buffer, I think Carol's right, the plantings at the top, right. for any visibility that might occur, is, uh, is probably the right idea. I did want to also say that the reason we came in part without a final plan is we've been working with uh, uh, Carolyn on this, but also to hear from the neighbors to see what <laughs> suggestions they have. And um, we're happy to do that. We're anxious to get our permit because as a community solar project, you have to have your permit before you can get in line. Mm -hmm. And we were hoping to be in line with the first pass, and it went out without us. So the sooner we can get our permit, we can get in line for the second pass, not only because of the incentives, but the incentives for the community, um, because neighbors get, well, the whole town gets the opportunity for a 10% reduction on their electric bill uh, for hosting this facility. First pass goes to the neighbors, but it's eligible to the whole town. But we have to be in the program, and we miss the first pass, and so we're so anxious to go forward. But the buffer, uh, We'd like to hear from the neighbors to see what they say, and then uh, I'd be happy if Carolyn and the planning department approves the plan that, that uh, is to where to put it. And then just one final follow-up. Um, there, there was a stormwater permit that was issued this afternoon, so that piece is taken care of. There are no additional comments from TPW on the other aspects of the project, so they're all square. This sounds like a good time to start from the public just one question did, did I hear you say there are 23,000 panels did I did I hear that right 16, about 16,000 16,000 right we'll open it up for public comment at this time so please come up to the podium and state your name and your address someone has already <coughs> Good evening, City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge. I was here before, which the first lot was the growing of marijuana. Now I'm coming back for the second lot, <coughs> which is for um, Con Edison on the Northampton Solar Farm. I met Co Edison sometime back February 15th in Attorney Etheridge's at office of letting me know of them having great interest and buying Willie's gravel pit property, the other piece that was available. They told me they wanted to develop a solar farm. We had a lengthy talk. I told them as a city councilor that they needed to be very transparent and communicate with my residents. After that meeting, I had not heard from them since the middle part of September. During our talk in September, they asked me if I would help them set up an agenda with them, which I did. I gave them input for the agenda. I told them to reach out to all the abutters and reach out further if they could. And they did do that. I have to say, I have been working with them. They have been excellent. They're reaching out. And that's the value with me as a city councilor. I also had them set up a room at Ryan Road School for their first meeting, which was held on November 6th on a Friday. It was pouring out that night, and we didn't think people would show up at all, but we did. We had, it was a smaller attendance, it wasn't bad, maybe about 30, 32 people that came out. And, um, people were given a chance to look at the presentation on the screen and ask all the questions that they needed to have answered. It was very helpful. 
but residents wanted more visibility on the first presentation because there were things that you really couldn't understand on that first presentation, but they were excellent. I told them, please don't rush my residents. Let them have the time to ask and hear or try to solve whatever their questions were, and they did. The second meeting was held on December 5th, which I could not attend due to another death in my family. Out of that meeting, I was told from some of my residents that 247 trees were cut. I am outraged as a city councilor, as a city councilor in my residence. You know, at the first presentation, and I know that Con Edison did not know what was going to happen here. That I do know because when they showed that first presentation, nothing was mentioned about how many trees would be cut down. I can't tell you the phone calls that I have been receiving from residents, and I agree with them. I believe in preserving our trees. That's what we have a tree commission for in this city. Trees are valuable on property, on property. And now I have a problem I have people going by and they think that whole property looks awful. And it does. You see nothing but all these stumps hanging around. I have residents here tonight from Lady Slipper Line who have great concerns about the privacy of the back of their property. And I am hoping, which I did hear tonight about fencing, <coughs> I really believe some of them did want fencing. They are here tonight and maybe Attorney Etheridge and Steve, you can get together and make it happen and make them be happy because that site is disgusting. And I am hoping that, you know, the Willards have done it. Con Edison is not being blamed for this, but I think the Willards gravel pit owner should have had the respect to come forth, to come forth and have a hearing for my residents, that's where the value was, to just go in there, which he could because he still owns that property and he did it within that 12 month period, which was legal for him. But nobody's gonna tell me any differently. Yes, he cut that lumber and boy, is he making a good profit on the outside with that lumber. And I have residents who definitely are suffering, suffering and need to have this planning board make it happen where they have their privacy you know you look at shrubs you look at whatever you start them off at two feet three feet it takes forever that is not going to be enough here to give them that privacy so i just want to say that the mitigation part of it i think is very very valuable here and i'm hoping that the planning board goes in the right direction Okay, the protected acreage, I'm very supportive of it, very. The city expects to build our Parsons Brook Greenway, Pine Barrens, protected open space as follows. Existing Parsons Brook Greenway off of Cardinal Way is 27.6 acres. The city purchase from Bill Willard, Inc. is 87.891 acres. Consolidate Edison donation is 19 plus acres. Just healthy donations, 20 plus acres. So you put in that total, Parsons Brook Greenway, Pine Barrens, 155 acres. That is a lot of acres, a lot of conservation land. And I think like with our management, with the city and conservation and our trails, which I'm into 100%, that the city will manage the conservation area like any other. It will be open to walking and fishing. We will improve the existing trails, close excess trails, clean out old cars, believe me, old cars, and debris, install conservation area signs, and manage for ecological habit, habitat restoration. The only thing different 
in this area, in this area, is the habitat restoration. There are some old standing gravel areas, which you heard tonight, that we in the city want to plant in trees and management of pine barrens, which historically had a fire ecology. This is new to the city since we have not done that before. So the city is going to have to consult with the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species <coughs> Program to get ideas about habitat management. In Ward 6, many, many people, no matter what the meetings are, just with Just Healthy LCC, conservation land is so valuable. Also here tonight, I am saying as a city councilor that my priority is my residence on Lady Slipper Lane. Second priority is that I am going to support this project 100%. And my reasons for that is because they worked very closely with me and my residents, and I hear tonight from them that they are very, very willing, if a fence is needed or weather, they, they will work with my residents. That's valuable to me. I also want to say that I feel, again, that Con Edison will be great neighbors in our backyards, and they will give us the respect of a good, safe quality of life, enjoying our homes, our backyards, and having peace and enjoyment, which many residents have not had in a long, long time. And you heard me speak about that before with LLC Just Healthy. This is very, very valuable of having a good quality of life, having them as neighbors, and having them working with my residents very, very closely to give them a good quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Um, good evening. Um, I think I should start by saying that having listened to the good questions and comments from the planning board and from the developer, I'm truncating my remarks so that there's not a complete repetition. <laughs> Thank you. But well, there is some I'm stuff. I'm going to ask you to start with your name and your address. Yes, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> so hi. so um, I'm Jack Warner. Uh, I live at 46 Lady Supper Lane uh, in Florence. Uh, I'm an abutter of the Willard property. Um, and I'm also the trustee of the uh, Tinkham Woods Homeowners Association. Uh, and in that role, I've been working uh, with the two homeowners who've been most uh, affected by this. Um, so I just want to give you a little uh, sense of what happened. Um, which I think is the one thing that you haven't really heard here. Um, although the solar farm has not yet been permitted, Bill Roeder, the owner of the property, has taken down an immense number of trees, destroying the 50-foot tree buffer which was promised at the project's first community meeting. Some of the trees which were cut were actually on the hill leading up to the property of the two homeowners most affected, residents at 34 and 38 Lady Slipper Lane. I mean, I'd be glad to point them out on the map or the whatever, you, if you need that. Mr. Willer sent out a completely insufficient notice about the tree cutting. It said that the work would start on November 19th, but the letter is postmarked November 25th, and it contains no details about the work to be done, just that there would be some noise, but not on Sunday. The homeowners at 38 Lady Supper have informed me that they received this letter two days after the work was completed. And even though I'm an abutter, I did not receive a letter at all. And of course, most importantly, the view from the backyards of these two homes now offers a completely unobstructed view of the quarry and the proposed site of the solar farm. And so I, I think it's important for the planning board to have some sense of kind of the visceral thing. I was actually out of town for most of the cutting. Um, I can, from the second floor of my own home, look out to the left and see it, but I've got two acres, so I'm, I'm heavily shielded by lots of trees that were not taken down. But I've been over to the backyards of these, these homes, and there's just, there's just nothing there between, you know, the home and the solar. It's just, it's just really outrageous is what it is, mm -hmm. uh, which is not what we're here to discuss, but it's just outrageous. Um, so I'm happy to say, along with other people, um, that Congress and Development has been very responsive uh, to the concern of the homeowners. They've made a site visit to one home already. They're going to make a second uh, visit. Um, nothing but good stuff to say about them so far, and that's, that's important, right? Um, um, and then I'll just end by saying, um, as you know, it's always the details of a project that require the most work. 
So we need the homeowners, the developer, the planning staff, and the planning board uh, to collectively ensure that the mitigations that necessary is done. And it sounds to me as though we're well on our way to do that, um, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, and I thank everybody here uh, for already starting to work together uh, to fix a problem which no one in this room caused. Thank you. Other comments from the public, sir? <laughs> Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Martin here, and I live at 34 Lady Slipper Lane. Um, I don't want to, you know, Jack covered a lot of, of um, some of the things that we had wanted to talk about. I, I think there's um, one thing that, well, I'll reinforce what he said about the, the communication, you know, uh, with Steve, and, and uh, Mike did come out and look at the site after I called Steve about the tree cutting. Um, I think that what I would like to add here is that the Sunday after Thanksgiving, um, an ATV and a dirt bike showed up riding along the top of the berm. <coughs> I, we've only lived there two years. We know historically this has been an issue. Um, so, so I went out to just to ask them to go to the other side because the, this is something that had been going on from time to time when the gravel pit wasn't being operated. So, anyway, I was just going to ask them to go to the other side. They left. Um, but the way it is now with those trees um, all gone, our, our concern is that there's going to be solar panels directly behind the property, and then a fence, and then between the fence, then there'll be trees, of, I think, at the top of the berm, was like what you were saying uh, before. Um, what we there they have to be planted in such a way and there has to be maybe signage or something uh, I know that you're not going to allow that um, that will Mr. Willard gave permission before you know so anyway that uh, we have a lot of concern uh, that's just one thing I would like to, to add as a concern about making sure that we don't end up with that problem coming back thank, thank you, you. I'm Lorraine Mangione. I'm at 21 West Parsons Lane, so that's at the northern side of this. And um, I wasn't planning to speak at all, but um, I'm just so shocked to hear the process of this. And to me, it really speaks to trust. I feel like I don't know who to trust because I went to a lot of meetings. I went to the planner's office when we were talking about the marijuana facility. And if I heard the word conservation and conserving land, if I heard it once or twice, I heard it about 4,000 times. And I also kept hearing that the land that was going to be used was the degraded land that nothing else could be done with. You weren't going to build a neighborhood on it. You weren't going to do anything. And I thought, I think most of the people in my neighborhood um, thought that that accounted for both projects because often both projects were talked about together, so the solar farm and the marijuana facility. So when my neighbors kept getting about a week or two ago, everybody was really upset, and finally I, I kept saying, they thought it was like right in my backyard. Um, so I want to comment on the maps. When I look at the maps, and I imagine I'm not the best map reader in the world, but sometimes it looks like the land that you have goes right into the, the, the in-ground swimming pool that we have. Like, that's where the low point of it goes. So that map, I hope, is wrong. Other times, there's a map that's on your site that doesn't have West Parsons Lane on it. Now, I understand in New England, you don't really live here until it's about 40 years, but it's now been, like, close to 30 years we've been there. Your map needs to have West Parsons Lane on there. It's not just empty space. It's real people that live there. Um, so I finally went out and took a walk. Now, on our side of Parsons Brook, they are not cutting down trees, thank God. But it was shocking. I will say I was shocked. I could almost see your houses from there, um, where that used to just be all woods. And to put that together with the way this has been talked about from the planner's office, we've talked about herons, we've talked about wildlife habitat, we've talked about the importance of tall trees, and they kept saying, conserve, conserve. For this to happen just makes me really have almost no trust in this body or this government. It's, it's really, it's really depressing. 
Um, and, just and, and, I think I, and I think I speak for a lot of people in my neighborhood. I, I don't want to speak for all of them, but. I just want to clarify, you know, so the, the tree cutting was the, the current property owner. I get that. Did that without, you know, that didn't come before this yeah. board. I get that. Um, yeah. So then why did you folks always use those words? Only, we will only be building on degraded lands. These are lands that nothing else can happen on. 14 acres of trees is not degraded land that nothing else can happen on. So that's where the lack of trust comes in. If he had the freedom to do that, we should have been told that from the beginning. This is still Bill Willard's land. He can do whatever he wants. That was not ever part of the conversation. I will say I didn't go to, to the two meetings that you folks had, but I went to a lot of the other meetings um, and I just heard these things. I went to the office. Other people from my neighborhood went to the office. We went as a group. Um, we've had email contacts ad nauseum. <laughs> um, I haven't, I, I, I won't say I've been watching this every minute, but I've been in the game here. So I understand that you didn't give him permission. But there's something that happened that there's a real serious lack of miscommunication. I don't know if it was purposeful. I don't know if it was accidental. But 14 acres is... Uh, we won't even get into the, the effect of carbon and all that on cutting down trees. That's, the Gazette has handled that argument, and um, it ain't a pretty one. Uh, so, but just, I think you could have presented it a lot more truthfully and honestly. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think I... I'm Ruth, and I'm from Lady Slipper Lane, and I, I just have some um, further questions. We've met with uh, Mike on our property, and I think um, he, seemed, he seemed a little surprised, too, I'm not sure, but of the, the um, cliff that's kind of behind our house, which was there, and there was a berm put around the Tinker Woods development, I, I'm assuming when it was developed against um, the gravel pit and um, some of that has eroded over time the berm and um, we talked about um, potentially having to build up some of that um, that cliff so that it's more of a slope with the um, remnants of the quarry that are there already. and then um, perhaps um, building or putting in some trees or um, different kind of barriers up there. But my question with the fence, just be, to be uh, clear, I know that um, the, the solar arrays need a fencing. And I was imagining that the fence was down on, on the bottom near the, near the um, property. And I wasn't sure if that was correct or not. Is that right? When we talk about fencing, we're not talking about um, there's privacy fencing, and then there's the fencing that has to go around the perimeter. I just want to make sure that we're talking about two different kinds of fencing, possibly. Or yeah. Well, right. what was recommended by staff was was you know not chain link fence, but uh, in addition to the security fence, like it, more of a um, aesthetic. Correct. Like the designer top of by, the by law, they have to have secured with chain link or right. with a fence. And that would be down, I would imagine, down near the footings of the of okay. the solar arrays. It's close. Right. Yeah, usually yeah. To Not up in, so into the, the slope so much. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to clarify some of that. And I, I think as far as like my husband was talking about with the um, the trees, I think it would look better um, personally if it was more of a naturalized wooden, wooden, wooded setting like it used to look from our deck. Um, with maybe some alternating type of um, evergreen shrubs like rhododendrons and some fast growing trees, evergreens in the back, not just little ones, but you know, a mix so that it's already tall, like to replace what was taken. Mm -hmm. And I think alternating with trees like that, and I don't know how to do that design work, but um, that might prevent people from feeling like, oh wow, we can walk up here, you know, which is what was happening with the dirt bikes. And I'm a little concerned, I'm not sure how the conservation land that's going to be developed 
which is, sounds really nice. And I haven't even been down in that area. Um, I'm not sure what, does that mean that people can go around everywhere else that is not fenced in? Like, do they, do they feel like they have the freedom to walk wherever they want? And my understanding is the conservation lands are, are include signage that indicate where that conservation land begins and ends, and there may be a trail network. Um, I don't think those details have been worked out yet because that land would need to be deeded to the city and then develop this conservation mm -hmm. land. So I think the idea would certainly be not to just have people running through uh, an open area, you know, and ending up in your backyard. I don't think anybody would want that. Yeah. Uh, okay. But you know, the, there aren't yet plans developed for how that conservation land would be managed or how it would be signed or anything like that. Okay. So I think that would be a, a separate issue down the road when we get to that planning part. Yeah. I mean, I think the issue is, that, you know, there's going to just healthy is going to have their operations there. They're not going to want people wandering across their property, which you'd have to do to get from the conservation area to your neighborhood, um, as well as the um, Con Edison piece. So. I'm not, I think the conservation area would certainly be clearly defined on the ground. Um, and the, uh, so I don't, I don't think that would really be an issue. And, and of course, access by ATVs will be extinguished. Um, I'm not sure how they come in now. You know, they've been coming in on every Saturday and I'm not sure where they come from, you know. Um, I don't, because it seems like the gate's always <coughs> locked at the, the Willard entry. So I'm not sure how they how they get in. <laughs> I don't know if they come through Cardinal Road. I don't know if that's a yeah. way that people come through or not. But, so um, it sounds like that will be um, thought about later that part. But um, the way it was before there were enough trees and stumps within the berm that it wasn't really um, looking like a good place to ride a dirt bike, but now it is. Now, it's, you know, because they've been up there and, and um, it's, if it gets flat and doesn't have enough growth placed around, then um, I think it, it would look accessible again and that, that's not what I really like. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank I'm Carrie Carlibaro at 138 Lake Silver Lane. Um, I just want to support um, what, um, what my neighbors have been saying. Um, and just to point out that we came back from, uh, we're new homeowners, we've lived there only a year. We returned from our vacation um, over Thanksgiving to find that our backyard was essentially decimated. Um, and we have been recently invited to reach out to Con Ed to, um, to do some, um, to talk about uh, plantings and, and barriers and such. We appreciate that, and we'll be doing that. Um, and we are more in favor of a natural barrier um, being um, installed as opposed to fencing or something like that. We really just like some, some more uh, natural view than what we have now, which is stumps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? I'm a little bit confused on the tree placement. The, like, maybe I'm not confused. We know what the tree replacement number is, and in tonight's hearing, if we don't have a, if we don't have it well defined on the plan, have, can we see new conditions and new conditions? Yeah. See new plans. Where tree placement? Sure. Be on the site. What's the best um, way for us to manage? You, you don't necessarily need to see the plans. I mean, I, I in a perfect world there would be a, um, a clear understanding of exactly where the tree replacement can go. There's so many tree replacement, there's there's so many trees that need to be replaced in accordance with the zoning that, that not all of it can come, go on site. So um, you've done this in previous applications where um, you create a condition that's uh, basically um, there's a formula in zoning so it's very clear to follow. The applicant needs to show that they've done the replacement in accordance with the zoning. So that can be done at the um, back end of the project before final sign off for, um, from the construction of these panels. And the reason why I would suggest doing it that way is because you know each of the trees that gets planted 
um, as screaming for the uh, butters on Lady Slipper would count towards that calculation. So we don't, may not know what that number is until you know they go on site and say, okay, let's put one here, here, and here, and stagger it, or whatever the number, and then they can count up how many caliber inches are being planted, um, and that will. Um, require some on-site analysis um, at the time. So I don't think, you know, you have the number they've submitted in the application of mm -hmm. needing to replace 247 trees, and the reason for that is that any time there's a, a site plan application that's been submitted within 12 months of a, of a cut, there's a look back for the previous 12 months, even if they don't, own, even if the proponent, the project applicant, um, uh, purchase the site later or what have you, they're still responsible for that. Um, so I think that part, I certainly would recommend that you have a condition that the total number of either planting on site or combination of planting on site or planting elsewhere um, or paying into the tree fund um, could happen at the tail end of the project. How do we, um, yeah, the, the sure applicant seems uh, willing to appease the abutters yeah. and has been talking with the abutters and so how do we condition with the number of trees that are required, it seems like we have more trees than enough to yeah. make everybody ha not happy but happier. <laughs> um, but how, how do we write that, that not only are you going to plant enough caliper, you know, the, dimensionally or quantity, right. whether it's on-site or off-site, yeah. or into the fund, but at the same time you're going to meet uh, the abutters. The abutters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you could do two, you could do it um, one of two ways. One is you could have a condition where you want to see the final planting plan and sign off on that, um, or assign, you know, the chair of the board to sign off on that. Um, or you could um, um, require, you know, I, I guess that would be probably the cleanest way to do it because mm -hmm. then you can, um, you know, if there's an issue, then um, the abutters can still could still sort of have some recourse because so seeing you know, the chair couldn't maybe wouldn't sign off on the plans if there's an issue. So would it be another so, formal hearing, hearing for the planting for? Um. Uh, no, it would. I wouldn't say it's a hearing. Um, I guess the way it could be structured is that um, you know you assign it so that the the chair signs off that adequate screening has been. Um, designed to uh, accommodate those two properties, what is it, 34 and 38 Lady Slipper, um, to comply with the zoning. The zoning requires a screen um, from a solar array. So um, the, but um, the chair doesn't have to sign off on that if it's the internet. It, it, you know, let's say if you assign it to test so that um, she doesn't feel that it meets the criteria, then you know she would have the authority but, to but, say yeah, butters wouldn't get noticed. I was going to say, but what if it meets the criteria? But it doesn't. Still isn't. Right. It's, right. Right. So I think before. So I guess the part A to that would be before it goes to test. I would say that you know um, it's a little bit of a um, mix between administrative and, and planning board review, but I would say I would see the plans and make sure I, at the staff level, the office hears from um, the abutters to make sure they're satisfied. Um, you know, if you want, I mean, the other thing is that um, you could just come back and do an administrative review in an open, in a published sized, on a publicized meeting date. So that then it could be open for public for comment. Would that yeah. prevent the applicant's application from moving forward if we? No, because they have a permit. There was a condition that prior to construction, okay. they have to show the final landscaping plan to the board, and then we could just post it on a. Um, I sort of talked myself most. out of that <laughs> recommendation. It seems like I would. Yeah. I feel more comfortable having the most sort of yeah. open 
you know, right. in a public hearing We've done that in the past where we've, we've, there's been a willingness between the applicant and the butters, and we say basically, you, you guys work it out. Right. If you're all, everybody's willing, work it out, bring it back to us, yeah. we'll stamp it. And, yeah. and so that we don't stamp something that meets the, the technical conditions right. but doesn't, doesn't make anybody happy. Make right, so it can be, you know, sort of um, before, prior to issues of building permit, final landscaping plans have to be reviewed by the board. Okay. At a, at a you know, notice meeting. Not, a, not an advertised meeting, but on the agenda. Carolyn, did you suggest that the trees would be planted before completion of the project? No, well, before final sign off of the completion of the project. So, well, so why, not, why not require it at the inception? I was actually because otherwise they the neighbors would be looking at a construction site. I mean, this is a big project. It's yeah. going to take a couple of years. Why not have the trees planted at the front end rather than the back? It actually is just probably a five to six month installation according to the application. Um, but I think tree planting could in a project like this because it's um, farther away from the actual, I mean, a lot of the work is going to happen down the hill. Mm -hmm. It probably could happen without interference. You know, right. typically, the reason why I said that originally is because in construction, you want to make sure you get all the right. construction done yeah. and not interfere with yeah. the trees. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I think you're right. So we could say, so we could change it to something like that. Right. Prior to the yeah, installation. Well, but the, the only issue is, is yeah. when, are, when are they going to start building? Can you put that tree in the middle of winter? I don't know. No, it's not advisable. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, they'd have to get their permit, and then within whatever, two months of getting the permit, something like that, uh, would that work? Well, I think, again, there's this kind of like actual like, calendar issue, like if that's. Right. Well, well, I it's mean, December right now, so. Yeah. Yeah. They get a building permit in. When do you guys expect, I mean, assuming everything went through, when, when would you expect to break that first ground? Um, that would be conditioned also upon uh, receiving a um, the, the incentive allocation to make it yeah. a community solar plant. Um, I mean, assuming all this happened. Is that, all, if that yeah. all that happened, then we'd be looking to begin construction uh, as early as January. Um, and then, as, as we were saying earlier, about five to six months, it could be even three for the net. Possibly through the four. Month? Potentially, yeah. So a, a lot of it is, um, uh, is, is is more or less good to go. And we've already uh, reached out to, uh, to to folks and done a number of these projects before, so we sort of have a good system for that. <coughs> um, but to your, to your point, um, you would not want to plant new growth, new trees, on a site where you're bringing heavy machinery in and out. Um, January. Particularly not in the winter. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but pretty much any time thereafter, you know, springtime, it's actually more species dependent mm -hmm. um, as far as when they should be put in the ground and the kind of care they require in the course of all that. But as far as I'm aware, I don't know of many, particularly because we, we want to work with, with really good landscapers who will warranty the growths mm -hmm. um, for a number of years. So, so we'd want to do it at a time when, when it's most appropriate, probably in spring. Yeah, Ellen, I think you is a really good point i think in this case because it's a, a very small discrete development it's not like village hill where it's phased and it's going to be right. numerous years you know i think there's a, a pretty small window within which all of this would take place so if it's prior to issuance of the building permit that would you know, hopefully not be would you want that we're yeah. not going to get a building permit yeah. but you mean before right. they construct the, or no, install the panels or after they install the panels if they were to, to do it after like if they you know were to kind of do it and how we normally condition like we normally condition it by before you actually put a pin in it and you're done make sure that the trees are planted well but i'm assuming i guess i guess if it's five months they'll, they'll be finishing it in the middle of summer Right. <coughs> I mean, they may choose to. It may also take a little, little bit earlier right. to get the right. get in line, right. to get the yeah. credits. It just seems like there's not a huge risk that this is going to be a five-year mm -hmm. situation with. But I, I but I do think that if it takes longer, my my feeling is is that 
given that I don't I don't know completely what happened with these trees. It seems like someone cut down some trees that maybe they shouldn't have. Um, <coughs> that, uh, that this as as soon as trees can be planted, given the fact that it is away from the the construction that they be planted. I mean you could say prior to issue prior to final approval but no later than June thirtieth. Exactly. I mean that's something like okay. that. Because you're not gonna be planting in July anyway, so mm -hmm. prior to final approval, but no later than the issue Well no. yeah, to give them a date and they know something happens with their some of their aspects in this plan that they may not happen in the first. They don't get the clearance to be a community solar array. Lost me stadium. Well, there's a chance that they may not have their permit. They may, may not begin construction to a, before June first. Right. Yeah. But I, it, the, the sense I get is, truthfully, if these trees are not talking down in the pit where solar ray is, we're talking up against Lady yeah. Slipper Lane. Yeah. That if you planted those May first or September first, it's not going to have any impact on the actual <coughs> installation of the solar. <coughs> is that correct? No, that's fine. That's fine. So that and then what George so is saying is if we're delayed because of the interconnect permit, we can always come back and ask you for an extension. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but what, I think what we're saying is that regardless of your delay, this has been done to there. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Okay, by June 30th. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Not a problem. Yeah. Right. Carolyn, does it does ordinance provisions about how long the trees have to last? to this situation? Um, well, you can, I mean, when you approve it, they, they have to last forever for the life of the plan. So if they die, they have to be replaced. It, it would. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not like a moment in time. Yeah. If, uh, last tree-based question. Um, <laughs> if the applicant is willing to plant a six to eight foot tree, um, is that more than is what is required with the tree ordinance as far as um, the there's only a minimum. The size for the there's only a minimum. Minimum height or caliper? Caliper. Cal cal so these would be so certainly we, much bigger, but they wouldn't get extra credit because they're bigger. Well, but can no. we, as part of the condition, at least for the trees that are Lady Slipper Lane, that those are whatever caliper they are, they're a height of six to eight, at least six. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, um, I would just like some clarification. Hearing a resident mention about West Parsons Lane, she mentioned something to the effect about the mapping. It, it may have been on one map, but all of these maps have West Parsons Lane specked out here pretty clearly. There may have been some earlier map that didn't show it, but it's all it's all pretty well laid out. Some of the maps are continued on another drawing yeah. so yeah. the top one drawing may not have it but the one that it's connected to the I just wanted to ask about the um, planting of the trees on, on the burn behind our house on that area where they were taken down by a, um, a machine that came around like a saw cutting type machinery that came. Okay. And um, I'm thinking with, I'm not sure, uh, they might know better because they're going to develop the, the, uh, the slope better. Um, but I think in order to get those trees up there to get planted, they would have to build the slope first and they wouldn't want their machinery up there if, with the panels already made down below. So. I'm not sure about the timing because I don't know how else they would access um, getting up there for, for um, all the plantings. Yeah, I think that's probably your, your job, right? Through, <laughs> so, like, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. that yeah. yeah. through your yard. Uh, <laughs> can you address the question? Can you address the question? It's all yeah. So the, the coordination of the efforts would be done to probably be doing all the earth working and the processing of the aggregate files. Right. That's going to happen first, mm -hmm. as well as processing of the any sums that are left. So that would then using that to 
grayed out the entire site, building that slope and at that point would make the most logical sense from a phasing standpoint to plant the trees. So that would be one of the first things that would be happening. So and then the trees after in that. like February then? Early no, March. probably be processing in and starting the civil work in the, in the March time frame. So mm -hmm. definitely getting the trees in before the June is would be our goal. Mm -hmm. So the slope would, would start, I mean, I was hoping that the berm would be raised up to where it was already before, you know, at the highest point. I think the plan, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, that was on, it's, it's showing it as matching the up to our property boundary on the south, correct? Yeah, I'm just going to go into a PDF and we're we'll really enlarge the area. Yeah. Yeah. And then just one more clarification. So what we're talking about as far as the condition is that um, if you know we were to approve this permit with a set of conditions, one of those conditions is that the final planting plan would have to be approved by this body again. So there'll be another, you know, so that you can all kind of have this discussion and they can get information from landscape architects and such and kind of figure things out. But that you know, it, it certainly some of these details you know don't need to be decided tonight. They, there will be you know a process in place to come back here and if. By the time it gets back here, if there's still disagreement, you know, <coughs> figure that out. But hopefully there'll be enough conversation amongst all of you that there won't be. Okay. Yeah, something Mike kind of zoomed in just shows. So what I did, I just, yeah, this is, this is LA2. What I did is I just zoomed in um, in this particular area. So this is the southerly embankment um, that's adjacent to Lady Slip. One of the things I just want to highlight here, where where the mouse cursor is, this is actually the property line. Mm -hmm. And this is about 50 feet, roughly, what we surmise to the clearing line, and the fence is going to be um, a little bit just beyond that. So as you can see, the existing slope is kind of all over the place. Um, there's a lot of pits and valleys. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to reinforce or bring the toe of the slope up to here so that, yes, there's going to be, we're still going to maintain um, about a three to one slope going down um, to, the, to the toe, so to speak. But then it's going to be very uniform going out towards the center of the site. Um, in addition, I think one of the things I heard um, was in regards to the stabilization, stabilization of this site. Um, we're actually calling for a turf reinforcement mat to be placed um, along that area to help stimulate um, some good turf uh, along that embankment. Right now, um, if anybody's been out there, it's kind of raw, open sand. So, so that, that's, that's kind of the idea behind that. I'm sorry, you used the word fence for it there. You actually meant whatever, whatever, whatever they decide tree. No, right there. That's in that's in that's 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 at the seven foot front. This is the chain yeah, yeah, that's right 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 talked to us about this and my wife just asked if it would be down toward the bottom of the slope and that's not down toward the bottom of the slope because uh, uh, Mike is correct he did the used the GPS to make sure that the cut line was 50 feet from our property but if you have a slope that's going out two feet and down one and you have a seven foot fence and you have the fence starting um, you know, only five feet, ten feet back from the top of that slope, we're going to see the top of the fence. So that fence, the way it's situated there, looks to me to be too close to the top of the berm. It's a seven-foot fence. You drop, you go out two, down one, that's six, five. You'd have to go pretty far back to make that fence disappear from the top of the existing berm. Mm -hmm. Just one point of comment that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the, the the seven foot fence is the requirement. Yeah. Correct. I mean, that's so. So there's no way to adjust that it is a seven foot chain link fence. <coughs> but um, there's the fifty foot buffer, and then the landscaping it's, will go in behind between I mean, the can, fence. And right the now, the, 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 the grading goes where the fence is. It goes from three oh eight or three oh six down to two ninety two. Yeah. So it's a fourteen foot drop, but the fence is at the top of that drop. Right. Is the fifty foot buffer is that level? Is it is that um, 
the existing condition of that, what shows the, the 50 foot buffer, is that grade continue to rise? It continues to go up. So the top of that existing berm is right in here. And what's the elevation so, roughly of that? So each one of these contours is, is two feet. So this is 308, 310, 312, 314. The very top is about 316. Okay. And that's the existing top of the berm. And then it actually drops off. There's a low point. There's there's like a little bit of a V, um, which is here. Um, that that you know that, that's going to be retained be only because in order to grade this back, what ends up happening is it's going way into the, the wooded area here. Um, so that again, this area will be stabilized and, and applied with uh, topsoil. But I just wanted to point out the top of the existing berm is is actually continues to go up towards the property. So this, the seven foot chimney fence won't be at the very top of right, that berm. right. Okay. We were concerned about that distance between the abutters and the start of the fence. We wanted to move it in. I mean, we could ask them to lose that last, that final set of panels there. It's about two hundred panels in a ratio. Oh, of I see. 16,000 panels, you know, we could ask them to make that a 75 foot bumper, something else. Well, isn't this extensive planting that we've talked about going to be between the fence and the yes. neighbors? Yes. Yeah. So even if the top of the chain link fence is visible, I mean, it really won't be visible if they plant enough trees in front of it. Yeah. I mean that's yeah. I mean that's what we would want to that's see the in the final planting plan. Yeah. I think if the consensus is we have more trees than we have space to fill, then we can just cram as many trees in there as we can to to appease the abutters, to shield the fence, to make everybody happy, and then without losing any panels. Okay. Folks, do you have the, a comment? The land has to be um, built more in order to support trees that would grow and have space. You know, because the berm is eroding and it's it's not at the same height; it's going down, and then now there's some stumps. So, right. um, yeah, I'm no, not I think sure what right. the grading and will do or the, making the slope first. But I think it has to widen out for sunlight and for the trees mm -hmm. to be put in there with machinery. And I think once they begin to even develop a planting plan, that, that all of that will be sort of part of it. That the planting plan doesn't assume that. You know, they're just going to kind of take a tree and put it in an existing space that there will be some site work to to make those trees viable um, and that'll be all you know we keep using the term planting plan but it really is a lot more than that in terms of kind of modifying the site and making it accommodate all the trees that we want to see there are, are stumps in the buffer zone going to be removed in that 50 foot buffer zone uh, there shouldn't be any stumps there, I don't believe, because this is the 50-foot line. I thought the impression I had was some of the trees that were removed by Willard were within that. There, that's there should be some stumps there now. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But not because of what was just done recently. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Oh, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. Uh, there, there's, there's, stumps, there's stumps going up to the properties. I've got photos of them. Yeah. 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 So there shouldn't be any, yeah, we shouldn't be any closer than 50 feet though, to the property yeah. line. So, put it this way closer, isn't it? Can we? Well, what are you asking about, <coughs> about the stumps? I guess. Right. Kind of are there stumps between the berms and your property line? No. 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 Yeah, and this is, yeah, once we start to see the actual planning plan, I think a lot of this right. will become more. But again, I, I think because this is the most serious impact on the abutters right here, these three abutters, mm -hmm. um, if we want to move that fence in a little bit, if we want to create more land for a, a really a good planting, which they really lost, um, I, I don't think asking the developer to lose one set of panels and increase that bumper space a little bit more is unheard of as we look across this whole array of uh, panels here. Mm -hmm. So I would just have the applicants keep that in mind as they look at the new planting plan and the grading and all. Because you have to lose solar panels, can't you just move the fence in? I know mean, you, you have to mow around there and you have to have access for 
servicing and stuff, but I mean. It's a slope, so you're not going to be able to plant that on the slope, but it's going down. The trees that you plant there are <coughs> you only planting on top of the slope, I would think. You would think 50 feet of plant room to plant should be sufficient to oh. accomplish the purpose. If 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 the location of that fence is, you know, there's a layout, there's a process to that. But if it's diagrammatic, if, the, if it shows the intent, but it's diagrammatic, and you and by moving the fence down the slope another two feet or four feet will shield the top of the fence. Then are there any issues with that? No, we, we would be amendable to that if we, if we, you know, even if we had to move it five feet to accommodate the additional plantings, I don't think that would be a problem. The only thing we need for access between this last row of panels, we need about 15 to 20 feet. That's all to be able to, for clearance between the panels um, and the fence. That's all. So you, you've got right now 15 feet from the top of the where the fence is to the bottom of the slope before you can get to the, the clearing of the panel. So if you need to play around with three to five feet just to right. drop the top of the fence. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So that's something you can all discuss. Mm -hmm. And so that would be part of the planting, the planting plan. plan. Mm -hmm. right. Like we would yeah. see that on the planting plan. And I'll just take everything that we have in issue and put it into the planting plan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we should call it a planting and fence location. Right. Yeah. And a butter appeasing the <laughs> 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 We should make clear that we're going to look at a combination of trees and location of fence. And fence, fencing right. and tree planting. Well, clearly, if the abutters aren't happy with the plantings, then we're going to know it. And yes. the right. butter of the fence will be a mover. <laughs> but it seems reasonable to hide the fence. Mm -hmm. 50 feet is. I think less than this room. It's right. not a lot of space. Yeah, it's a lot of room. And, and I think now their hope is that it would be hidden based on where it, where it is, yeah. but that it, they, they still have latitude to move there. So, uh, so we'll, we'll address that when we see the planting plan. Uh, there were a couple of additional staff comments um, regarding the land that will be dedicated for conservation, that that uh, shall be needed to the city. Uh, and then also a reference to a bond that must be posted that's adequate to cover the cost of decommissioning. I'm assuming you've seen those or you're familiar with those. Uh, and then any other comments from DPW, but it doesn't sound like they had any other comments. Um, other discussion, George? So, um, yeah, I have a, a kind of a larger question. It's more of a city process, maybe a permitting question. The applicant has spoken really clearly about how sensitive the area is of wetlands yet they haven't gotten their CONSCOM permit yet. So I, I wonder when they go for the CONSCOM permit, if there's alterations then, I know they delineated 100 foot buffer, 200 foot riverland buffer, but there may be some impacts that we're not aware of that may shrink the footprint of this or may move the access road. Just in general, I wonder why with all this time they didn't go to the CONSCOM first and make sure of their boundary of their the footprint of the area before they came to the planning board. Yeah. So it's a, it is up to the applicant to decide the, uh, what permit they want to get first. Um, they're very um, small encroachment areas into the 100 foot buffer. Um, and if they had to tweak things, um, um, and, and they are previously disturbed areas, um, so they, if the Conservation Commission um, required them to modify the location or the shape of the detention pond, for example, I would say that doesn't really affect um, so much the site plan the planning board approves because it's a, um, as long as there's still, um, I mean, really it would probably affect the stormwater permit. They'd have to go back to DPW and potentially modify their stormwater permit application. But from a site layout, they're still creating, they're still taking care of their stormwater. The panels are still in the same location. If the road gets shifted by one or two feet, I don't think that's, um, my um, suggestion to you all would be that's not a significant enough change to trigger it coming back. 
anytime there is a significant change based on another board's decision, then they would have to come back, and it's their risk to come back, to have to come back and amend their permits yeah. to the planning board. Does the city get money out of a um, solar project like this? There's um, an agreement uh, pilot, a uh, payment in lieu of taxes, that's, um, that's typically um, drafted with the city, with the mayor's office, through the mayor's office. So that's occurred here? Uh, it usually happens after the permitting or parallel to it. I don't know what the status is. After. Uh, may I ask me? Yeah. Uh, it has actually uh, been drafted, sir. Uh, it's uh, currently under review. Um, I believe it's in executable form. Uh, the dollar amount in question is uh, $64,500 per year. Mm -hmm. It's higher than my property taxes, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <There's that. Let's> <laughs> <approve>. <laughs> um, any other comments from the public? George, go ahead. So explain to me, and maybe this is Carol, something that we did at the applicant, that little flagpole that goes down to Ryan Road at the corner of the north end, there's a little like flagpole access down there. You did not approve that. That's old land. That's old deed <laughs> stuff. But it's, so it's it's part of the conservation land. It's part of this property. Is that going to be so? My question is: looking at this huge parcel and the between West Hampton Road and Birch Pit Road, Ryan Road, we don't have any access really. I'm thinking of kids going to mm -hmm. schools at Ryan Road. I'm thinking of a multi-use trail. I'm thinking of, is there a way before this is solidified to see if there is a, some kind of access that can go from West Hampton Road, whether it's through Bayberry Lane or Southern Way and get over to Birch Pit Road using that flagpole? So um, there, I don't, so I don't know about the, the, um, goal is to certainly have as many access points to open space as possible from different neighborhoods. Um, this will connect over to the open space that is um, us, that was created as part of the Cardinal Way subdivision. Um, there's also an access, a public right-of-way from Sovereign Way at the end of Sovereign Way. There was mm -hmm. a strip of land. Yeah. That is um, a city right of way. For and whose access. parcel is that? Do you know if this is on that high end or whatever? Nope. That goes into um, this piece. That's part of the, if I'm. Part of the proposed. If, uh, can you, <laughs> you can hold that up just so we can see what you're pointing to? Yeah. This so one. So there's an area of land that the city is yeah. um, purchasing from Weller that would be open. And that's the connection that will go over to um, Cardinal Way, but that's part of the 155 total acres uh -huh. that will become conservation. Okay. okay. On the side of the room feeling? <laughs> Concerns? Questions? Comments? We moved and closed. Okay. You can do that. So if, we'll if folks feel comfortable, we <coughs> All those in favor? Those opposed? Sorry. I, I'm sorry, I had a few more questions that they might need to answer, but I'll just leave it to board discussion. Let's have it, George. Sure, what the heck? Um, I'm, I'm semi-retired, so I have a lot of time to look at plans and maps now. I, I, I see the new, the new road coming off of uh, Ryan Road into the new cultivation facility. It's going to be called Bit Drive now. <coughs> B I T. I think it's just bitumen, bitumen is right. It's just is the that? surface material. Yeah, oh. it's just the material. Okay, sure. Yeah. 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 Two minutes <laughs> drive. <laughs> yeah. 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 All these yeah. clarifications. <laughs> That's great. Uh, bit drive. I thought they had to be approved by the city council. We need some volunteers. Yeah. 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 Can we talk a little bit about uh, what we call the the end of life? plan, the disposal plan. After 20 years, we heard that the life of these are about 20 years. So if you remember at the last solar array we talked about up by Mola Taurus, mm -hmm. um, they gave us a certain amount of money to the town in escrow. What are the details right. of this one? 
So they offer, they suggested there would be $140,000, so I think you should um, condition a bond to be right. posted in that amount. Okay, and the detail, I think, just to take away the solar panels and maybe the, the stanchions. And the poles and the utility oh, poles. Oh, the utility poles. Mm -hmm. So yeah. can we add in there the, the batteries? Again, I don't know to what extent. Oh yeah, oh, all all oh, of that would be well. So all, any any uh, how do we phrase that? Any material like hard surface like any uh, like any hard surface, surface is that part of the decommissioning process? Yeah, yeah. 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 removal okay. of all the elements of the system. Okay, because if we ever wanted that to go back to farmland, nature, whatever. Right. Um, I, I see on the cut plans the, the stanchions themselves, they sit in kind of sauna tubes, not on pads. It's actually right? a, a German post. So you take an I-beam like you would a guardrail and you drive it in the ground. Uh -huh. So then so when you go to remove it, all you do is pull the post out. So there's not a concrete? No, not unless there. we were to hit something in the ground that drove an alternate foundation, but typically it's not required. And based on the geotech, it's all sand there. We're not anticipating any issues. Okay. Did you say about $24,000? $144,000. Does that include removing the fence? The fence would also be removed. So, so that's not what I see on the cut sheets here in the photovoltaic array that says uh, concrete concrete posts. You wanna, maybe I, again, I'm misreading this, you know, me and my bit, but. Oh, this is for the this is the fence. This is actually this the is fence, and there's a the concrete uh, footing for the fence. Okay, so this is uh, yeah, this is the extension of the modules to the just driven I beam into the ground. Oh, I'm sorry. So here's the link here and fence. Okay. Thanks. Okay. 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 Right, but is there is so the commissioning the open to interpretation of what yeah. the commission means? Well, some say, well, that just means the panels and others. Yeah, I mean that could be true, but I think you, I mean, um, I think you've named all the elements. I know we've named it, but I'm wondering. I mean, well, does the document? It, does it you can condition it. Yeah, so right, we condition it, then it's then they don't adhere to that condition, right? So yeah. we say we include the fence. De decommissioning, including all system man-made. Including the fence. Right. If I did my math right, that's eight dollars and seventy-five cents per panel, and that includes getting rid of all the structure on which it right. rests right. and the chain link fence. It's not much money, and that's in twenty years from now. That's nothing. So then we'll break the leaves. Should we reopen the public hearing? We should do that. Did you, you didn't take the final vote? Yeah, we, 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 oh, we, we didn't, we closed the vote. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry. <laughs> we could reopen it. We need to clarify this. The city, your kid, is somebody, who determined that $150,000? The applicants suggested that amount. So I can't speak. Sounds like a bargain. I don't know. I mean, that's a lot of structure and material to get rid of for $140,000. Well, our, our last one was only $34,000. Yeah, but well, you haven't had to get rid of it yet. It actually goes very quickly to take it down. I mean, uh, when you go to build it, it goes in a lot slower than it was when you go to take it out because you're going to not be looking for uh, as much care, right? So you're going to go through with a impact on take all the modules down and you'll throw them in one pile and then you come through the machine and rip all the steel out and you're going to just take a sawzall and cut it. Ready and the, uh, the, the, the calculation of, of that number takes into account also the salvage value of the metal. And so these are actually rare earth metals in the modules, so they have a lot of salvage value. Um, the, the true cost of removal in most cases um, uh, is, is probably closer to zero, net net. Um, the decommissioning bond is there just to ensure that you can get the process started. But pretty much any scrapper would, would jump at the chance to come out and, and take away the equipment. Are there fluids in these panels? No. No. I'm not saying board, not Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I the other thing I was confused about on these plans is this 100-foot interconnect. 
um, I think it's called a 100 foot wide interconnection. Yeah, it's almost like an access. <coughs> Anybody Which help me with that? Which year are you on? Um, LA3. LA3. There's a 100 foot wetland buffer, but there's also a proposed 100 foot wide interconnection and access easement. So I understand that correctly. That's an easement on that gravel road of 100 feet. To go to the, to come through the just health. And that's an arrangement that this applicant, applicant makes with the just, with the other folks, not with us at all. Um, I also wondered about the uh, the timing of the construction um, of these two projects. If they have any conflict with one, that's something between them also and their lawyers, right? Nothing that we can involve with. It's still not even five o'clock. Right? So, go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve the special permit um, by CEB Northampton Solar for large scale ground mount array at Birch Pit Road, Lawrence Map, ID 3879 and 80. It's a condition. Um, related to the, let's see the storm water's already been through. At the bottom. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, prior to beginning construction, the land to be dedicated to the city is offered by the applicant, so be deeded. A bond posted that is adequate to cover the cost of decommissioning the site, including removal of proper <coughs> Panel, utility poles, and we change that language a little and bit. Batteries, yeah. fencing. Batteries, and fencing. Okay. Yep. Um, so, uh, and then uh, the second proposed condition has changed. I think what we're adding there is that we will, we will, somebody give me that language. Final site, the final site planting plan before uh, issuance of the building, before the beginning of construction. Before the beginning of construction. But <coughs> well, and then I, I would think you should break it up into two, that um, um, final, t uh, prior to um, uh, final sign-off of construction or no later than June 30th, the landscaping shall be installed along 38, 34 and 38 phase lane. Is that planting and fencing? Yeah. And or fencing. And or fencing. Okay. Because, yeah. Well, I think it depends discuss. on the landscaping plan. Right. So planting um, in accordance with the approved plan. Um, and then prior to final sign off of the construction, final tree replacement calculations must be approved by staff, and any payment in lieu of tree planting must be made in accordance with the zoning. Is there a second? Second. Mark? All those in favor? Those opposed? Thank, Thank you very you. much. <coughs> okay. George, you do, was that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I thought you had a little more time to attend to you, just so you know, we're going to keep working here. Especially in the middle of the year. Um, you're right. So, there's an existing house across the road, 
Um, this house, uh, they're going to carve off the back portion of the lot from the so, so this is 38 lady, lady slipper, and, and you know we're going uh, we're going uphill here. No, and there's no, trees no. taking yeah. all of us. I mean, it's just in the, in it's the just outrageous, the really. Yeah, I'd have I mean, to see where that is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this guy is. And our and the city with a CED solar This is you know. Well, I mean, I was watching this on my iPhone. Yeah, it's just yeah. Yuri's already out the door. Adjourned. <laughs>